Thanks. This video represents IFISC as of today. And to face the future, we go ahead with our roundtable discussion. So let me introduce our panelists. Barcelona Institute of Complex Systems finally could not come because of uh, an urgent uh, family uh, problem that happened on, uh, during this weekend. We also have uh, Henrik Jensen for the Center for Complexity Science, Imperial College, London. Please, Henrik, if you... Yamir Moreno, which is the uh, president of the Complex System Society. Luciano Petr Pietronero from the Institute of Complex Systems, Consiglio Nazionale della Ricerca, Italy, Rome. Jean-Michel Ross from the Max Planck Institute for Complex Systems in uh, Dresden. Ancho Sanchez <coughs> from the uh, Association of Complejimat in Madrid. And finally, Stefan Tarner from the Complex We will start with uh, Tour de Table, in which I ask the panelists to address issues of present and future opportunities, new trends, difficulties to be faced, what to do and what not to do in the field of complex systems. Thank you very much. I uh, hope everyone can hear. So uh, let me start. I think the most important challenge is to ensure that research and complex design, a science of complex systems, we need to extract conclusions from the many case studies done by complexity scientists. We are looking for a general coherent theory consisting of a conceptual framework and a mathematical structure. So what we really want, what we dream of, is a general theory of something like co-evolving, non-stationary, strongly interacting, and quite often stochastic high-dimensional systems. So how are we going to achieve that? Let's first talk about education. A greater awareness of the importance of complexity science is very much needed. I believe that everyone should be exposed to concepts such as emergence, collective behavior, co-evolution, interdependence, and so on. This should start in school and certainly continue at university levels and in all disciplines. I strongly believe that right now we suffer politically from a lack of understanding of how our world is <coughs> interdependent. And this is equally a problem in society as it is in the world of research. Well, as we all know, it's about 2,300 years since Aristoteles pointed as if it is just a linear sum of the parts. Examples of this, I think we see, for instance, when psychological concepts are used in an attempt to understand sociology and economics. Say, we learn in school in Denmark that the Second World War started because Hitler was mad. That's probably not the entire story. As often as in the case of political debate, so that's what we see often in political debate, right? When we, dis and, uh, when we design syllabus for the training of the next generation, of scientists according to subject boundaries of the past with no attention or very little attention to transdisciplinary knowledge. So this, I think, is very important to try to change. And it's known to more people, but still most researchers and most non-researchers are not used to think in terms of complexity, complexity concepts such as emergence and interconnectedness. So I suggest that we have to work on the following points bring complexity into the basic syllabus, both in natural science and in social sciences and in the humanities. Why we want to do such a thing? Well, it used to be that European universities expected all students to obtain some familiarity with philosophy and philosophy of science to ensure 
that everyone had a feeling for what knowledge is about. Complexity science is somewhat like that. It's very much the foundation that tries to understand how knowledge of the parts may relate to understanding the entire system. And of course, that's not limited to any uh, subject field. Educa Education-wise, we also want to explain the distinction between applied service activities of complexity scientists and attempt to establish a complexity science as a field that identify shared common features across the range of very different complex systems, say such as rain and brain, for instance. Relate to this, we should ensure that complexity science continues to consider the systemic level. Otherwise, we may end up with a situation like systemic level to a dedicated sub-branch called systems ecology. We need to make clear to everyone that complexity, what complexity science adds to the analysis, which often can be phrased as that complexity science helps to bridge the gap between the parts and the whole. Say, for instance, the gap between single neurons firing and the dynamics of the brain, how concepts develop, what thoughts are eventually, hopefully, we'll understand. So while we develop this understanding of the importance of complexity through uh, activities in education, we, of course, have various um, opportunities research-wise. So let's turn to that now. Let's first say a few words to just think of, say, brain scanners uh, should encourage us to combine information theory and network science to establish descriptions of complex systems, such as the brain, in terms of time-dependent networks i.e. for to go from multiple parallel recorded data streams to networks of directed interconnectedness. And they'll be time dependent, obviously. However, information theoretic measures of causality or directed interdependence are difficult to establish robustly. So systematic comparative studies on many different types of systems, say brain, finance, climate, are important in order to learn which of the different approaches is best for be of a great step forward. Um, so think of a facility where sets of high-dimensional time series could be deposited, so anyone with a suggestion for a way to establish causal connections can test their method and post their results for comparison. The popularity of data science offers great opportunities for this kind of facility if just we can find the right way of engaging with the data science community. So let's now turn to theory. Again, we want to establish this general theory of, theory of co-evolving, non-stationary, strongly interacting, stochastic, high-dimensional systems. And I myself think of this as something that could help us to what we call the tangle nature models, which some of you may know of. The way towards this goal. They both, of course, build on long existing activities, but with the suggestion that a degree of refocus may be helpful. Let's uh, first talk about self-organized criticality. So from the very f start, the focus was on power laws and criticality as scale invariance, or scale invariance <coughs> simply meaning criticality in that context. The degree of SOC found in models and phenomena were just on the quality of the observed power laws. And recent work, as also has been discussed here, especially on Rayner Brain, I have in mind, uh, find that these phenomena does not happen at a critical point, but rather wanders about in some state which possesses tendencies to produce broad distributions. Well, and this does relate to suggestions by various people during the last 25 years of as pointed with because they didn't exhibit power, proper power laws and scaling might actually be very relevant exactly for that reason. I think that we should take a look <coughs> again at these models and relate them to the analysis of, analysis of activities and of systems like brain and brain. The models and the systems have in common that they only to a degree exhibit power laws. So if, say for instance the famous Drossel's forest fire model may help us to understand 
general mechanisms that lead systems to explore states with broad distributions, although not really residing at a critical point. And now, finally, let us think about antique openness and how to establish the statistical mechanics as we go from microcanonical ensembles to canonical ensembles. A lot of interesting work has been done on entropy measures in situations where strong correlations reduce the size of the available phase space. When we turn to, say, biology, the situation seems to be the opposite, namely, that phase space may grow much faster than ex ex exponentially. <clears throat> So when you bring components down in biology, of course, you create new ontological entities, <coughs> offspring, new states, new possibilities. This has been called open, anti openness by uh, some ecologists, and I think an interesting and promising research question is whether axiomatic-based entropies can be used to establish probability measures. <laughs> Please, Yamir. Um, um, thank you very much. So um, uh, I'm here as a, the president of the Complex Systems Society. Um, the society is, is an organization that is uh, 15 years old. Um, and it was born in Europe, but now it's expanded to um, the rest of the world. Um, we have around 1,000 members that are actively participating in the activities of the society. Um, from thematic school that are partially supported by the society to the flagship conference that uh, is organized every year and gathers uh, around 700, 800 individuals. Um, and in fact, Maxi San Miguel in particular uh, and the IFIS in general has been linked to the society since uh, quite many years. Um, and we have recently had the honor to confer Max de San Miguel, the senior scientific officer, where we go, stating um, that uh, precisely recognizing that uh, the Institute um, works not only locally or even uh, at the level of the country, but I think it's, it's a well known institution also at the level of the society. And, and, and I think that that will continue to be the case in the years to come. So, in the last um, 20 or years or so, uh, the field of complex science has entered into a new age. Uh, this is partly because the combination of new theoretical insights and the data revolution that has provided the ground to a number of conceptual milestones in many disciplines as diverse as biology, physics, engineering, economical and social sciences. All of these areas are reflected in the activity of the FISC. At the same time, we have been able to identify new challenges whose solution will confer the science of complex systems an unprecedented applied dimension. Uh, here today, I would like to focus um, um, today uh, with the ever increasing growth of both the world population and new technologies. It is fundamental for the well-being of the humanity and our society in particular to understand how humans interact among them and with the new technological environment. It's expected to be uh, the population of the, of, of the world is expected to be around uh, 9 million individuals by the mid of, of this century. Um, and we are already generating a vast amount of data and as a result of human activity. So there are a lot of pressing questions and phenomena and human behavioral response, this would be quite relevant in situations like emerging catastrophes or, or emergence of social movements, or even when we study and try to predict uh, the spreading of diseases in which it's well documented that people react to the presence of the disease and therefore um, this should, have, uh, should be taken into account. So if we can anticipate this social collective behavior under which scenarios, at which scales, these are all multi-scale complex systems, do we have data to answer the aforementioned challenges or will big data be sufficient for that purpose? I think also that it's a question. And finally, is it 
our online behavior the same as our offline reaction or response? Many of us are, are now using data coming from social systems, online social systems, but we don't know if that is a fairly uh, account of what happens in the offline world. So that question is also to be answered. And, and finally, the biggest question of all, do we at all know the laws governing human behavior? These key questions perhaps constitute some of the major challenges, I think, in complexity science. Socio-technical systems and civic are governed by nonlinear effects and can often adapt to both external and internal perturbation. That is, we have roughly all the ingredients that defines a truly complex system. If we are not successfully describing the socio-technical man, we need to understand, among others, some basic problems such as how humans interact with the environment and other humans, how cooperative behavior emerges and survives, and how social networks evolve and shape the way we communicate and interact with each other. To this end, we should develop new ways to analyze existing data, perform new experiments and analyze new data, or generate new data of different sizes, um, analyze hypothetical and develop hypothetical scenarios and come out with human behavior in a plethora of situations and hopefully provide hints to policy makers with the aim of creating a better and more sustainable society for the future. On its turn, given the universality of many of the concepts and methods in complexity science, we are also sure that the new methods will also contribute to the development of all, all other areas, and in particular to the development of the physics of non-equilibrium systems, economy, and even ecological problems. Finally, I would like to mention that to achieve the aforementioned goal, it is mandatory to work in a multi- and interdisciplinary teams, and I think that IFIS is a clear example of how this should be done. So, uh, my I choose, I think that one of the research lines that is in Adifis and that should, should continue to work on that is precisely this one, how human uh, behave and interact with the techno, uh, technological. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yamir. Please, Ruggiano. Yeah. Well, first, uh, I'm very glad to be here and I would like to express my congratulations to, for the foundation of the Institute and for the uh, celebration of Max's uh, birthday. So I sympathize a lot uh, for you know, establishing an institute because I did uh, something similar in 2004 in Italy. I established the Institute of Complex Systems of the C CNR and I directed for 10 years. So I'm aware of how difficult it is and uh, you know, what are all the million of little and great problems that you encounter. So I would encourage you to continue in a successful way this interesting, uh, uh, this interesting activity. But let's go to the of the 90s. The 90s were a beautiful time. I was much younger. <laughs> I was much younger, and uh, I, I knew what I was doing. You know. <laughs> because I was doing fractal growth and self-organized criticality. Now, these systems uh, were part of physics, were part of critical phenomena. So I could judge them. I could judge myself, I could judge my colleague. So I felt as a good referee for this field. Today, for example, take what Alessandro Espignani has shown, who is a form I am honored to have him as a, among my students. I cannot judge anymore what he is doing. What he is doing uh, is uh, outside. It has to be judged by people in epidemiology, in medical, it's something else. So I think we are passed from studying fundamental problems, because my opinion, for example, when I studied DLA, the fractal growth, I thought, I mean, this complexity can be bullshit. I mean, that's a fundamental problem. Either I understand something there, or is no point I do some data fitting somewhere else, okay? This was my attitude. So I spent many years trying to understand. That was, a, for me, a fundamental, maybe wrong. I liked it that way. The same was self-organized criticality. So I felt very secure what I was doing. And I had the presumption to decide myself that what I was doing was somehow important, at least the question. Now this, we have lost this sort of ingenuity or somehow this self-confidence. Because after the 90s, the 
to invent new models. So what we do after the 90s is to adopt our models and methods for other guys, for economists, for medical people, <coughs> for social people, for philosophers. This is interesting, but very risky, because we are not anymore the judge of our field. So we have to deal with other fields. And this has uh, challenges, uh, problems, and a lot of uh, new situations. I'm not sure whether it was better before, but I mean, the past is always more clear. The future is hopefully <coughs> adventurous, but also uncertain. So you see, we are now doing things that has to be judged by other people. And this as a risk, we can say, I decide what is important for economists, I are physicists, but they don't know that I've decided what is important for them. So they may disagree slightly with me. And that's what happens, you know. So when we, you deal with other people, it's not so clear that what you decide is important for them, they agree it is important for them. This is totally new to me since the past 20 years, before I felt uh, in equilibrium. Now I feel not so anymore. <laughs> Okay, but it's also fun. Then, uh, what is the uh, uh, possibility? I mean, we say power laws are everywhere. We had the talk today, you know, power laws are fractals, uh, whatever, uh, networks are everywhere. So, we are the general scientists, and we solve all the problems in the world. Okay, this is also implemented, uh, and I have to say, without great success. So, I think this we should not say. We have to be a little bit arrogant, because arrogant means self-confidence of bringing new ideas in a field. But also we have to be humane to understand what really is important for them and not for us. So, it's, I would suggest a mixture, a little bit of arrogance, a little bit of humility, and uh, taking things serious, what is a problem for them. So, uh, then... There are uh, great opportunities, but, you know, real success stories are not so common today after 20, 30 years of complexity. People tell you, what do you really solve? You know, did you do quantum mechanics? Did you do relativity? You say, we have a lot of models, we have interactions, etc., etc. So I think we should be careful to focus and to try to, uh, to push the, the success stories, which there are some, I mean, I mentioned some. But so this we have to be aware. So... And also, we have to be aware that the situation, you know, if you see power law or fractal or self or whatever, I mean, self organized criticality, these things appear everywhere, but they are totally different in different disciplines. I make you two examples. If you go to geophysicists, you know, people who study earthquakes, you have beautiful uh, fractal distribution, chaotic behavior in time, and so on and so forth. And then you have a magnificent law, the Gutenberg-Richter laws, that tells you that in the whole world, and in an infinite time, there is a beautiful power law that tells you, you know, how many earthquakes you will have of certain magnitude. So we like the power law. The power law is uh, criticality, is renormalization group, so we make useless. I mean, apart from our own career with the papers. It's totally useless because in earthquakes, what people want to know, they want to know whether tomorrow there will be an earthquake here. So you want small space and small time. And what is our answer? Our answer is that in an infinite space and in an infinite time, we have this distribution. You see, for us, this is the solution. But this means that what is the solution for us is not a relevant problem. So the armory of tools of complexity, which I love, is not suitable for addressing what is relevant in geophysics. That's why if you talk to geophysicists, they love you because, you know, you make no harm to them. You write together a little paper, no problem. There's no intellectual discussion. Totally different astrophysics and cosmology. You know, today the only solution of Einstein equation is the homogeneous universe. If you measure galaxies, they are far non-homogeneous, at least up to a very large scale. But this you cannot put into the equation. So if you tell cosmologists that the universe may be fractal up to a point, as I did in the past, they hate you because you take away their ground. You see, they don't know how to solve Einstein equation with the fractal source. So what do they do? They solve the usual Einstein equation with homogeneity, and they add the dark matter and dark energy. And that's the mess of the situation of cosmology today. They react to you and to the idea in a totally different way. So you have to go into each of them and try to understand what you can do. Uh, so my, my prediction it would be that uh, when people will understand how to put complexity into Einstein equation, which uh, we are also trying a bit, uh, 
it is likely that the complexity of the space-time distribution of the metric, this uh, will eliminate dark energy. This is my conjecture, okay? I tell you here, if it is true, in 20 years you pay me a drink, okay? <laughs> <laughs> if, not, I be, if not, I'll be in pension. Okay, so this is, so that, that I want to say, you know, story, same power law, same things, they have totally different approach, uh, perspective, and importance. Some is more important, some is less important. Let's go, so my attitude is uh, complexity has limits, we have to be aware, we have to study these limits, we have to explore these limits in detail so that we can push them forward, okay? If we think complexity solves everything, you see, we are somehow dead, there is nothing to do, we have solved everything, but the others may not agree, okay? That's a problem. Now, finally, physics and economics. Now, this is what I'm doing since a few years, and uh, the situation is very interesting, and here my position, my personal position, is much more on the, what is the problem, why economics is not really a science. There are data, there is a lot of mathematics. If you open up uh, economy theory, economic theory, pool of stochastic equations. And so, what's the problem? Well, the problem is the approach that you have when your experiment disagrees with your theory. Let me mention a little personal episode. When I was at the third year of uh, study at Sapienza, some years ago, I was about 20, I had to make an experiment, the Millikan experiment, to measure the charge of the electron. These experiments were done by three people, but the other two, I don't know, went to have a coffee. So I had to do it myself, and I was not particularly skilled. So I did the experiment, I found out that the electron had charge one-third. Pretty interesting, you know, that would be the quark. So I had two, two possibilities in front of me, you know, the great success that I had discovered the quark in a little lab, and the other possibility was that I, I would be rejected at the examination. You see, I had a disagreement. So the other two guys came back from coffee and we all agreed that the electrons should have charge one. So we, have, we had the feeling that it was element. You know, what do you do when the experiment disagrees with you? You know, it's a very precious uh, concept uh, in which uh, physics, uh, we, physicists, uh, even I was a young student, but I had the feeling, where should I go? You know, try to do the examination and not uh, to get the Nobel Prize for the moment, okay? That was the idea. So uh, this, idea, this, this concept, uh, physics has 200 years of experience, and economists have almost zero. And this is really the problem. So whenever... Uh, I mean, I'm not talking about all, I tell you my experience. If they make a model, a theory or whatever, and gives a totally absurd results, uh, you see, they consider it a discovery. So I think the real problem is the feedback of uh, experiment theory, which I have witnessed, I could tell you many episodes, I mean, now is uh, no time, but that is the thing. So we have a big advantage, you know, we can adjust our models, as has been done always in physics. And so in my opinion, this is the precious value that physicists have uh, to have this feedback from experiments and so on and so forth. Now, finally, uh, one other thing, after the crisis of 2007, a lot of standard economists, but those people are totally informed, totally rational, there is a single agent for everything, total ridiculous theory. Now, this story is not useful at all. It is true that they use these concepts, but after almost 10 years, if you go on with this story and don't produce anything concrete and better, you know, the answer will be, okay guys, you criticize us, what can you do better? And I'm talking about uh, prestigious institutions like the Institute of New Economic uh, uh, thinking uh, established by, by, uh, by Soros and Stiglitz. I'm talking about the, the chief economist Paul Romer of the World Bank with whom we now interact. He says as soon as he was uh, you know, nominated, he's, he's a standard guy, even though he had some original idea. He says, economic theory is a church of Scientology. Okay, he was immediately kicked out. At least half of his uh, job was <laughs> taken away. But they were right. Because, you know, these people were part of this uh, situation. And now, it's 10 years we are talking that the economy is all rubbish. So the only interesting thing is not to repeat this mantra again, which is, is, we may agree, but it's not useful. But the only measure is uh, 
constructively. What can you do better? And better means uh, not to discuss with academia, because academia is totally ideo ideological, but to produce concrete results for policymakers and business people. So my where we had some success and we have uh, very constructive interest arguments, even though you, you may be right. But you will convince somebody in the World Bank, as we managed to do actually, that our method is superior on forecasting and analysis of country. So my proposal is, uh, you know, there is no one route to swallow. One, uh, I mean, there are many, how do they, bifurcation, one has to take decisions, uh, but uh, especially for economics, my idea is uh, don't discuss philosophy, show concrete result and take the challenge of, you know, challenging them on their ground for uh, concrete stuff. Finally, this also brings us to the big data, but I don't have much uh, to say. Uh, I mean, I don't have time to say much. Uh, I, I agree with uh, what has been uh, mentioned by, by Vespignani, by Vulpiani and others. So big data are also big confusion. So you have somehow to put the hierarchy in the data and somehow big data don't answer problems automatically, you have to ask the right question and put uh, somehow a signal to noise concept in the data. This would bring us into a long... Having said all this, I enjoy what I do and I wish you the same. Thank you very much. Mornings. Now, Jean Michel. Hey, Luciano, I hope you also have a chance to talk to Mario Draghi at some point. <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, right. <laughs> so anyways, it's hard to talk after him. I will be brief. So. I come from a Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems, and we do anything but complex systems. You see, we do biological physics a little bit, condensed matter, and my department is finite systems, all kind of systems which have a boundary or have only a finite number of particles. So I watch complex systems a bit from the outside. We have always been interested, also my colleagues and me, in concepts of complex systems, nonlinear dynamics, and so on. And I have asked myself quite often, what is actually the origin of complex systems? And so I put a few statements, and they should be a bit provocative. I guess that's the point of the roundtable discussion. You don't have to agree. They might be wrong. So for me, the modern logic is actually the birth of complex here, yeah, uh, which was actually really brought to everybody's, I think, attention finally in the form of Gödel's incompleteness theorems, which for me are still the most fascinating yeah, thoughts which have come across in, in logic. They basically make a positive statement about that you cannot say anything, you cannot decide anything, but this you can say for sure. <laughs> and this is fantastic and I think this is the birth really of complexity because complexity always has this kind of gesture of feedback, of coming back and applying something again. And the self-referencing is the origin of all these beautiful things which our colleagues have intelligence, which were, in my opinion, not successful. We could discuss why this is the case. We don't have time for that. But eventually, complex systems arrived in the natural sciences, I would say, in the broad sense, through the hype of chaos. This was maybe again in the 80s or something like that in the last century. And next station for me is then, I leave out many things, which you do, <laughs> also here, network theory and computing power. And in my opinion, they have allowed complex systems to mature as a mathematical field and also go into, of course, applications. And these applications beyond natural science, this was mentioned, and we hear examples here all the time in biology, engineering, economics, social sciences, they have made complex systems research popular of course, of the success of complex systems, it kind of dissolves into the disciplines, and we just heard this. You need a lot of knowledge of the phenomena in an individual discipline to really apply successfully and meaningfully complex systems uh, kind of concepts. Otherwise, it stays very theoretical, like the power laws Luciano just uh, talked about. Now we come to the presence almost, and of course, for me, this has to do a lot with machine learning that boosted, is boosted by the access to vast amounts of data and the capability to handle them, keyword big data. And I think this machine learning will kind of reinforce the trend that we go into applications. We actually go into applications before we understand anything. 
and I offered him a position. He said, you know, no offense intended, but I think it's much more interesting right now what all the companies do. I learn a lot and I make a lot of money and I will do this. And also another anecdote is one of my former students works for Google California and he told me last fall when I visited him that he was almost kicked out because it took him two years to actually get what they really want. They don't aim for any understanding. They only want that something works. And he was always thinking as a physicist, being trained as a physicist, he wanted to understand why it works. This is not wanted, this is not needed, that's a waste of time and resources for Google. Okay, so now we have autonomous and intelligent systems, discussion about uh, using robots for elderly care and so on. Of course, that poses a lot of questions of ethics and the empirical success sets aside the question why an intelligent system works and what the solutions, in quote, mean it comes up with. But all this criticism carries lots of opportunities for the future. This means essentially we should learn, and I think I heard this before here uh, at the table, about machine-human interaction, rational versus irrational, by advancing positively perceived projects. So you can, for instance, use, and I heard this from a colleague, it's a crazy idea, but it tells you where it also might go. You can use actually uh, computer-generated solutions for complex kind of situations uh, for mediating problems, let's say in a neighborhood. The neighborhood kind of fights about where the, the waste is put forward as a proposal is taking advantage for the guy who proposes that. He's having the best uh, solution out of that. So what you do is you put all the boundary conditions in, all the wishes of the people, you have a program which generates the best solution. And the best solution is of course totally awful and nobody likes it, but it's accepted because all the members of the neighborhood clearly trust that nobody gets an advantage from that. And then you can try to actually work with this and go beyond it and basically iterate a human solution by people from the neighborhood with inputs from the machine. So that's, for me, a totally new concept, highly complex, and it combines irrationality and rationality. I find this very interesting. But of course, and with that, I'm at the end. The fundamental question is very much thinking about how one could actually probe this and how it could take advantage of the incredible possibilities and opportunities of machine learning, but for really research, not for just generating results. And with that, congratulations, Maxi, to you and your institute. And I will be very curious to see what you will do in the future with machine learning. Thanks. Andrew, please. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, yesterday I spoke to Albert Diaz, and in his name and also mine, I want to congratulate the Institute and its brilliant director for it, their trajectory. Uh, now, uh, coming into uh, what I want to say, you will see that some things uh, I'm going to say will resonate with what Jamil and Luciano just said, or in a different way. So when I was thinking of the things I needed to tell about social physics, because in a way, in a way, I agree with Luciano that we may be losing our viewpoint at, as physicists. So let me, let me elaborate on this. So social physics is not a new idea. It's 200 years old almost, and this uh, nice fellow there, Adolf Ketelet, was its inventor. And he published a book in 1835 uh, in which he uh, studied uh, the men and the development of its faculties, and it called it an essay in social physics. And he was worried about uh, measuring lots of things about uh, crime rates, uh, marriage rates, uh, and he even got a mean field idea of what the average man should do and what should be a theory for that. So he started this field of social physics. Interestingly, uh, Comte, who is considered ontology, and uh, Ketelet himself realized later that the important thing in his book was social physics. So the second edition had social physics as the first name. Uh, 
So having said that, let me fast forward 150 years, uh, and then uh, Sandy Penland published his book on social physics. This is the first edition, this is the second edition, and the subtitles have changed, but both are social physics. And let me quote from this book there, he basically claims that uh, social physics is something driven from big data and from detecting patterns in big data and uh, all these kind of things, all, all, all the, as he says, the cramps that we are living in our digital life uh, around. Well, that's Ketele 2.0. We haven't gone any further than Ketele. If we just look at data and we don't get any understanding of what this data means, they get a lot of money, but you're not doing physics. Big data is not social physics. Physics means understanding, and that's my first claim here today. If you want to do physics, you need to understand mechanisms. In particular, going back to what sociologists already knew a hundred years ago, society is about interaction. It's not just data on how we move or how our economic transactions are or what we post on Twitter. It's about interaction between people. And it's also, and this is another sociologist, it's about collective phenomena arising from those interactions. So that's what social physics is for me. And for that we need to understand how humans behave, how humans interact, and how, in particular, the digital life differs from the actual life. Because we know a lot about how we discuss with each other in Twitter, and we know a lot about trolling people in Twitter, but we don't know how people talk to each other, and how they make decisions together. And this is something that needs advancement. In particular, let me quote from these primatologists. It's always useful if you want to understand humans to speak to primatologists, that if you want to understand society, you need to know what kind of people we are. Are we more selfish? Are we more complex systems? are about many units interacting that exhibit emergent behavior, and that's the society. You could discuss whether that's social physics or complex systems, or uh, excuse me, of computational social science. And we wrote uh, a paper on that a few years ago, and I do encourage you to read it, but th that would be more like a discussion on names. To me, that's, that's probably more social physics. And this, again, connects with what has been already said, there's one thing that's reality, and reality is in big data, but it's also in experiments, and it's also in the old surveys the sociologists still do. And there's more to reality. And that reality needs to be incorporated in models that feedback on this reality and produce laws. And that's what we should be aiming at, producing laws in physics. We have a loss of motion, we have theories of uh, forces, that's what we need to do. And in that respect, we are doing very badly in respect of models. And I'm not saying that myself, I took the opportunity of this uh, quite famous paper written by a number of good friends. And uh, let me see if I can read this because I, I really love it. Uh, the introduction of a profession. In the end, they said, the contribution of physicists in establishing social dynamics as a sound discipline grounded on empirical evidence has been, so far, insufficient. And this is still true today. So we need to understand this that Richard Feynman said. We may have very nice theories, but if they don't agree with experiments, they are wrong. And it seems that many of us don't understand this. And for instance, uh, there's, uh, that's a paper I, I, I wrote of, uh, last year in which I was commenting on a theoretical paper on cooperation dynamics that quoted like 150 other papers, and not, well, just one experimental paper, and that was wrongly quoted. So you really need to look into the experiments, and you really need to look into the evidence. Toy models are not social physics either. And that's something that I really want to convey today. So I'm normal social physics, which would be test what we are inferring from data. If we, don't if we don't understand the causality, we don't understand what's going on. Test the predictions of agent-based simulations and other simulations. Compare what happens in small systems versus large systems. I, we now know that they be may behave differently, even if there are theorems proved by economists that tell you otherwise. There's emergent behavior which we don't really understand yet. And there's also working on true social contexts, not on spin models adapted to, I don't know, any kind of social uh, idea. So that is the ultimate challenge 
we face in social physics, come out with the grand unified theory or social phenomena. Yes, you may be thinking I'm going crazy. Yes, that's true. But that's what I encourage you to do in the future if we are to advance social physics. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sancho. Thanks for IFIS, fantastic institution. The problem is when you're the last in a row that you can just reassemble words. I cannot introduce anything new. Um, but I think we, we have a huge opportunity. And um, this opportunity is to make an integrative and collective effort. Lugiano has pointed to it. Um, we don't have a showcase really to show. We don't have a modern showcase to show in our complexity science community. Our grandfathers do have a couple of showcases in complexity, like chaos theory, like, um, I don't know, the, the, the alpha roll bar problem, the Santa Fe stock market, genetic algorithms, gene networks, things like this. But we, in the 2000s, don't have such a showcase. And uh, in this sense, as Luciano pointed out, we are different from quantum mechanics, from, from physics, from general relativity, from material science, from healthcare, economics, from, um, and, and in that sense, I think we have a huge opportunity. And I think that this opportunity is not in the life sciences, not in medicine, not in physics, but in society as a collective outcome of social interactions. How, how the Homo sapiens organizes itself, finally. It's, um, the, the horrible thing is that we have all the components at our fingertips, components that we have partly um, developed ourselves. We understand multi-level networks. We, we understand temporal networks. We understand how, how to quantify social interactions. We know a little bit of how decisions are made of homo sapiens. And we have data, 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 networks, networks, networks. Um, why is it still such a mess when you ask the question, what is, what is our society? Um, and I think it's because we are, we are working extremely badly as a community. We are not asking ourselves how can we coordinate and bring the thousands, maybe it's hundreds of bits and pieces together that we have. Our, it was also already mentioned, the hundreds of models that we have on different aspects and put it together for a real um, understanding of what society is. We know hundreds of bits and pieces. It's very similar, I think, to the state of quantum mechanics just before of experiments, bits of understanding, but it was not put together as a single thing. Maybe for society we cannot do that, but what we can definitely do is to find a minimum toolbox that is, uh, that is um, able to understand most of the phenomena that, that exist in society. So, um, more and more often, yeah, so the, 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 the great thing is that we more and more come to a situation where about entire systems we get complete information. Namely, that every bit of information that you can have about the system, you do have. And for the first time, this allows you to do one-to-one -one modeling. So you can make models of agents where every, ag where every person in a country is one agent, where every company is one agent, maybe not every virus in a country is maybe not yet possible, but, um, and, and with, with such tools um, that we are now about to build and will build definitely in the next 10 years, um, why is it not possible that we Copenhagen or something to pull efforts together and try to solve a showcase that we can show around and say this is what, what, um, what our community is really doing. So Maxi asked 
us also to talk a little bit about dangers. So I, th I see one danger in the assimilation, the evaporation and absorption of our community in other communities was also already mentioned. We're, we're losing to be real physicists. We're uh, um, becoming something different. And I think there's two ways to assimilation. One way is that suppose we invent something new and something, uh, sometimes it really happens. Say, for example, in econophysics, physics, um, someone invents something. Then we, we present this to our community and, and that's it. It's completely ignored by those people who, who should be interested in it, with exceptions. Some people listen to uh, people like Luciano, but that's a real exception. Typically, it's completely ignored by economists or politicians what is produced there. What is happening instead is that after a while, some economists are reinventing exactly the same thing, rename it a little bit, and, um, and sell it within their own community without, uh, um, they just make bad jokes about econophysicists has happened in the New York Times by Paul Krugman, who was mentioned. Um, it's, it's a pattern. And in this way, we are losing um, um, the, the credit we are we're, we're serving and which we need for, for getting funding in the future. The second way of assimilation is that we are starting to do things for other people and other institutions that others should do. We are more and more becoming city planners and healthcare planners and central bankers and, and uh, workers in the ministries of the interior. Um, and um, we do that because we, we are so fascinated by the data we can get a hold of, but we really shouldn't, we shouldn't do the jobs of others. What we should try to do is to, to understand deeper <laughs> and uh, very often I see it in my, in my own work and in the work of, of friends we're getting very often more and more shallow in our works um, because we're doing works of others and as a city planner you don't have to you don't need fundamental understanding so um, not take the risk that complex system science becomes a blah blah science. I think that is a, a real risk and could really backfire. And this in combination with not, not having a real showcase that really worked or works uh, is, is a true risk to our existence in a 10 year uh, perspective. I think we must be or always remember, we must always remember that all what we do must be quantitative, predictive, and that we're doing an experimental science. Otherwise, we'll be blown away. So, the future of complex systems is, maybe I see three ways for the future. One is that complex system science becomes a mainstream science, so, Everything is good, lots of jobs are created, we have an impact, we change the world, we save the climate problem, etc. Um, maybe there's a little bit of quality decline as, as every science faces that becomes a mainstream science. Um, that's one way, maybe. Maybe not very likely. The other one is that we are getting wiped out by jobs that are created in artificial intelligence now that are promising much, much louder things that we are not uh, ways. And um, the third future that I see is the one that I would strongly prefer, namely <coughs> that our community remains a niche product um, in the sense that it remains a powerful or it becomes a powerful community that gives stimulus to other branches of science and that it plays somehow um, a role in an ecosystem of, of sciences, of scientists, and it, in, in the role of the, that I could envision that we could play is to be a shark in that ecosystem, to really 
try to maintain quality in other sciences. And we're, since we're entering other fields, we're already there and um, could push our physics standards there a little bit. And um, as such a niche product, the nicest thing to think about is to have a couple of institutions around the globe, maybe a dozen of institutions like the Santa Fe Institute or IFISC, and um, to do the most creative things we can do. <clears throat> Thanks, Stefan. Thanks, all of you. I appreciate it that no one said how great we are but that we really focus, or you focus on which are the challenges that we have for the future. And this is the scientific way to, to go, I guess. Um, <clears throat> on, uh, uh, criticism, or if uh, any one of you wants to comment on what the others have said. Yes, please. Well, I, I find that a lot of the focus has been on social aspects related to complexity. Um, I think that in many other fields, complexity approach has had a lot of success. Uh, I have a bit of a gloomy feeling from what I hear, and, and I don't think that that's the general case. I think that we are in a unique situation with an enormous opportunity, and to do many things that before were out, of, were out of our reach. In particular, I'm thinking about systems biology. If you work on systems biology, you know where you are, you're not lost. And there the challenge is to have had the opportunity, the will, and the perseverance to really get in touch. My new, new knowledge is being created, and new ways of seeing the systems have uh, appeared and big advances, advances have, have been uh, found, no? So, but generally, I, I, I think that um, if I would talk to a young person now, I would say that this is a moment of enormous opportunity. And you have the full possibility of having developments in many areas. A lot of mathematics has been developed um, because of the appearance of complex systems approaches. And in terms of centers that have been created there in some other places, well, in, in the case of Mexico, that's where I come from, there's been a Department of Complex Systems since 27 years ago as part of the Institute of Physics of the National Autonomous University. And a year ago, a Center for Complexity Sciences itself was created with its building, like you said here, there was a moment in which you had the idea and then you have the building and then you have the people. And there's a big push so in which you can approach many things taking advantage of the approach of complex systems. Thank you. Any reaction from the table? No? No comments on systems biology? Just okay. Yeah, I, I agree with, with uh, what you just said, uh, and I think that uh, the applications of complex systems in biology, for instance, should be a model for the case of social the applications to social sciences. In, in any discussion of biological complex systems, there's always experiments there. There's reality there. And that's why I decided to put focus on what we are not doing well, which is losing touch with the reality. Henry, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think it connects to the importance of at least believing in that complexity science is a science in itself and that the need to work with the different disciplines is also of course to help the disciplines if you like but even more to try to extract and concentrate the uh, common features and I think we should try to make meetings for instance that turn things a little bit around and not um, just a collection of and make that the theme of the meetings and then invite people from wherever to come and see what they could contribute. What is emergent? Can we quantify it? Can we, and if, if we do that across different systems, maybe we start to learn a little bit. What is systemic time? Is that the same as uh, atomic time? What is coevolution? What does it do? 
I could continue. Why are systems hierarchical? So start with the concepts and the, um, the, um, the structures that we believe are characteristic to complex systems, and then get input from systems biology, sociology, and so on. Thank you. Theo, please. So, uh, my remark goes into a similar direction like Gustavo's, and in particular, I'd like to comment on, on this risk that if we go with our, as theoretical physicists, if we go and enter new fields, that we might not be accepted by the experts in the fields and that they might just ignore what we are doing. Um, and I'd like to comment on this from the perspective of uh, theoretical neuroscience. Um, well, for instance, in the mid-80s, um, quite a number of people have discovered um, the Hopfield model, for instance, of uh, neuronal networks were very similar to spin class models. And, of course, this group of people has not been accepted on the long run by the neuroscientists. But on the other hand, some of these, even of, of this group of people, have continued working in, in neuroscience, like Heinz and Polinsky, for instance, he belonged to this group. Uh, and uh, not only because it's, uh, he was interested in spin classes, but he's been become a ver uh, highly respected theoretical neuroscientist. And uh, so over the years, quite a number of people have really entered into this field, theoretical physicists. They are not accepted by all uh, experimental neurobiologists because uh, not everybody understands uh, the need for theoretical physics, but they are accepted by many um, uh, experimental neuroscientists. So what's the, why is it important? If you imagine that we are now at a threshold where we will soon understand, be able to understand the functioning of uh, small uh, neural circuits are uh, managing by their collective interaction, are managing uh, to solve cognitive tasks. What's going on in our brain when we solve some cognitive task? And this can be understood soon. And of course we need since it's done by the interaction of many uh, neurons in a network, dynamical interactions, uh, this can only be done if we use a theory, if we describe this theoretically. And there are many young and very strong people working in, into this direction, uh, modeling uh, the dynamics of these networks. Um, and so I think we are accepted in the field, in neuroscience, and there is a big need, and there is a number of experimentalists who see this need, and there are some others who don't just understand it. Thanks, Theo. If there is no... Uh, okay, very brief, please, Matrix, Neil, and then we finish, because we, we need to close. Okay, stop counting. Uh, I was watching yesterday in BBC interview with Gary Kasparov because of some uh, anniversary of Deep Blue or something, I don't know. So Gary Kasparov said, everything we know how to do, machines will do better. So the journalist, everything? Everything we know how to do. <laughs> so of course you can view this as a tragic news or as a very tragic uh, nuisance that all of us will lose work uh, because machines will do it better. <laughs> but of course I see it rather <laughs> as an opportunity. There is so many things that we don't know how to do in particular in complex system area that the future is bright. Thanks, Patrick. Please, Neil, and then we close. I'd like to challenge us to think about the difficulty we have as physicists in having a long history uh, that received knowledge, if you will. Uh, I suggest that physics is one of those fields that is least 
open in the higher education curriculum to new discoveries, that we leave that for the research thesis at the end. And we might learn from these newer and emerging fields that bringing modern discovery uh, earlier into the curriculum is a way to excite a broader population with where physics is going, uh, rather than emphasizing received wisdom of pulleys and inclined planes and other sorts of things that are well understood. Uh, we have trapped ourselves in some ways in insisting on foundational knowledge as the only way towards advanced knowledge, and therefore we limit our more exciting discoveries to a smaller and smaller population, and therefore with a lesser and lesser impact. Thanks, Dil. <clears throat> we have two more days to continue our discussion, but now we have to close the uh, session.